Hello, and welcome to BIOS Frontier Science. I'm Kate Shannon, and today I'm excited to welcome Eric Apple, Assistant Professor of Material Science and Engineering at Stanford University. Eric, to kick things off, could you please give us a quick introduction to yourself and the projects you're working on? Yeah, sure thing. Uh, thank you again for this invitation to come here. Um, well, my lab at Stanford focuses on developing uh, polymeric materials for biopharmaceutical formulation and controlled delivery. So most of what we work on is developing new materials that can help encapsulate protein drugs in particular um, and either make them faster or make them slower depending on a given application. Um, and oftentimes a, a lot of that ends up uh, interacting with a number of different fields because there's there's so many different kinds of, of drugs. Um, and we also often have a, a a bent of global access, right? Trying to improve the stability of, of drugs to um, enhance our ability to ship them around the world, for example. Awesome. Excited to dive in. But before we do, one thing we like to ask our guests is if they have any common threads or North Stars that motivate their work. Yeah. So uh, a, a real central theme of what we work on, as I mentioned before, is on this controlled encapsulation and delivery, right? Um, one, one thing that I like to highlight generally um, is that, you know, you can have the best active pharmaceutical ingredient in the world, but if it doesn't get to where it needs to be when it needs to be there, then you don't have a drug. Right? And so a drug has to be, uh, as a, a whole, um, you know, uh, getting the active ingredient to where it needs to be. And so that's really what, what we focus on is, um, trying to develop technologies that allow us to get the kind of control over where and when different uh, molecules are, are presented to the body, for example. Um, and there are a lot of really fun engineering challenges associated with this uh, problem that can be used to address a number of big uh, challenges. Awesome. And before we get into specific projects, a lot of the work you have going on is based on supramolecular interactions. Can you please kind of give us an overview of what these interactions are and why they're important or useful in the life sciences? Yeah, that's a really great question. I get that uh, frequently, partially because it's really a mouthful. So supramolecular chemistry means chemistry beyond the molecule. Um, so a lot of times, you know, if you study chemistry, you think about building molecules, right? How do we create new chemical bonds to make a new molecule? Uh, supramolecular chemistry really focuses on uh, sort of the next step. How do you get molecules to assemble in, in uh, precise ways? Um, and oftentimes these assemblies uh, have, you know, what you might call emergent functions and new things that they can do. Um, and so really what our uh, lab focuses on is uh, leveraging the fact that a lot of these uh, interactions are are very specific, meaning that they will continue to work even in complex media, such as in blood or in tissues in the body, um, to do cool things. Uh, right, and one area that your lab is applying these super mother sorry, it is a mouthful, you're right. Supramolecular interactions is in developing hydrogels for sustained delivery of therapeutics. Could you talk a little bit about the work you're doing here? Yeah, so uh, hydrogels as a class um, of materials have existed for a long time, right? I mean, they, uh, the, the simple definition is that you have a network of polymers that are swollen with, uh, with water. Um, one of the real benefits of the use of hydrogels in general for encapsulation of proteins or cells or things like this is that you uh, you can create a depot that maintains the native aqueous environment around whatever it is that you're trying to encapsulate. Um, but one of the issues is if you think about, let's say, sustained delivery of a drug, um, there's a number of engineering challenges that uh, need to be overcome, right? So this gel must uh, be able to be formed easily uh, around your drug or whatever your cargo is without hurting the drug, uh, for example. Uh, preferably, it would stabilize whatever it is you're, you're encapsulating. Um, it needs to be easily administered in the body and it needs to be able to form, let's say, a little depot, right? Which just means a, a little blob and some tissue um, so that it can slowly 
uh, let's say, erode away and, and release the entrapped cargo in, in that tissue specifically uh, or prolonged over a, a period of time. Um, and uh, eventually you want this thing to just dissolve or degrade away and really leave no trace behind. And so uh, the traditional approach to building materials with covalent bonds uh, really, it could solve a number of these problems, but it really faced some issues with particularly administration uh, and the dissolution or degradation process. So what we're trying to do is leverage these supermolecular interactions. You know, oftentimes we refer to them as a molecular Velcro, right? Because it's a specific non-covalent interaction between polymer chains uh, that can be leveraged to make gels. Um, but because it's Velcro, it happens autonomously, right? So the materials can be formed really simply. You just mix two things together. Uh, that's really a, a mild process. It doesn't involve heating or uh, you know, complex uh, chemical reactions to occur. You simply mix things together and thermodynamics does the work for you. Uh, the other aspect is that because these interactions are dynamic, um, you can have a fully formed gel and then when you push on it, let's say in a syringe, you know, you press on the plunger, the Velcro peels apart, the gel falls apart, and it allows the material to be easily injected through standard uh, syringe and needle. And then they autonomously and very rapidly uh, self-heal back into a little, uh, a little depot that can enable you to prolong the delivery of, of the cargo. So by leveraging the, these kinds of design parameters that have been developed in the field of supermolecular chemistry, you can make materials that have really distinct properties. Interesting. So some of these distinct um, properties that your lab is developing, how do you plan on using them and how do they differentiate the gels that your lab is building, um, you know, different applications that can be used for? versus the traditional gels that we've uh, seen so far? Yeah, so some of what I just mentioned, you know, is focusing on the, the various mechanical aspects, right? How do you get these materials into uh, the body? Um, you know, one, one question that often comes up is, you know, how, how long is long, right? If you want a long acting formulation, um, you know, there's a, a number of cases where, um, you know, delivering something for three to five days is certainly longer than just injecting it in a saline solution, but that's not really long enough to be uh, disruptive in a, in a given field, right? You're oftentimes looking for three or four months or maybe even six months of delivery. And so we, we that is the target that we're going for, is trying to develop materials that can be uh, easily administered and that can dramatically stabilize the encapsulated cargo. Um, one so that it stays good, uh, stays active while it's in your body over the course of four to six months, um, right? Because it doesn't help anybody if uh, you're delivering this drug over four months, but all the drug after month three is no longer good. Um, and that actually has a um, uh, an interesting side benefit that uh, I mentioned before that if you can dramatically stabilize your cargo so that it stays good at body temp for six months, then you can certainly improve its storability, right? Um, and so one aspect that we think about quite a lot is how can we improve uh, what we call cold chain resilience? So the ability of these materials to either be stored at room temperature uh, or experience what are called, you know, big excursions in temperature if you're shipping this around the world, particularly to uh, lower middle income countries that don't have as uh, robust of a uh, framework or um, uh, infrastructure for cold shipping and storage. And so for your hydrogels, where where are you looking to apply them kind of early on? Yeah, so we, um, the two major areas that we work on in the lab with our gels is in the area of amino engineering, um, particularly because uh, it's a space where there's some really complex and fun engineering challenges. So, um, you know, so far I've just kind of been talking very generally about delivering molecules for a long period of time. And it, and it makes sense in the context of 
let's say a, a chronic disease where you need to repeatedly dose something and uh, dosing daily or every week uh, is okay, but compliance is poor. And so it would be better if you only had to inject yourself once every six months, right? That would improve compliance. Um, and so that's a, an important challenge. But um, one of the areas that, you know, really gets the, the scientists in me excited is in these areas of vaccines and cancer immunotherapies where combination therapies are kind of the name of the game, right? You have complex mixtures of physical chemically distinct molecules. So molecules that are very different in their chemistry and in their size, uh, and they need to be delivered or uh, presented to the immune system in, in precise ways in order to get desired outcomes. And so it poses a really fun uh, delivery challenge. And uh, one of the other unique features that we've been able to um, build into the materials that we've been developing uh, is this ability to encapsulate things that differ dramatically in their size, but deliver them simultaneously over the course of weeks to months. Right? And this is a, a really uh, unique feature that I'm not sure many other materials have been developed that show that capability. Um, you know, so our first real uh, target in that wow. area was in, in the case of a vaccine where you have um, particularly a subunit vaccine where you have an antigen and you have some adjuvant of, of sorts to uh, improve the immunogenicity of the antigen. Uh, but oftentimes antigens are proteins of some sort and the adjuvants can range anywhere from being nanoparticles to small molecules to very high molecular weight nucleic acids uh, and getting those to be uh, presented to the immune system over the same time frames, um, really critical to getting the, the kinds of uh, durable, uh, high potency, uh, high breadth immune responses that you know you would hope to get from a from a vaccine. Interesting. And so you know, these are obviously a few capabilities that we haven't seen with other hydrogels before. How do you think this is going to expand their use? Where else do you think that this type of hydrogel could be applied? And what other, what other applications would you like to explore? Um, yeah, so one, uh, I guess two big areas that we've been playing with um, are, you know, one is a sort of a tangent off of this amino engineering space to improve uh, CAR T therapy. So encapsulation of therapeutic cells um, because one of the things that we've noticed with our immune, uh, both in the cancer immunotherapy space and in the vaccine space, is that these gels uh, create a local inflammatory niche upon administration in the body. So they can uh, recruit and train immune cells locally in this uh, hydrogel, you know, over the time frame dictated by how slowly uh, the gel itself dissolves away. Um, and so we figured if you can inject a vaccine and you can recruit cells locally and train them. Why can't you encapsulate cells uh, and deliver them within this immuno, uh, immunogenic niche that can improve their expansion and, and activity uh, in vivo? And so uh, we have you know, a collaborative uh, project going on right now with uh, Crystal Mackle um, here at Stanford, uh, encapsulating uh, CAR T cells to improve their uh, therapeutic potential. Um, one of the other big areas that, that we've been working on as well um, has nothing to do with encapsulating drugs and delivering them, but really just leverages the unique mechanical properties of these materials uh, to prevent post-operative adhesions. So uh, adhesions are internal scars that are formed after surgery, and uh, they're a really big, very long-standing problem because they form essentially in every tissue following uh, any type of surgery. Um, and we have some really great results uh, in both small and large animals, showing that if you simply spray or spread uh, the gel around on, on tissues uh, prior to closure, following a number of different surgery types, uh, you can prevent the formation of uh, these detrimental uh, internal scars, right? Without impairing the, the healing of what it is that you're actually you know, doing surgery on to, to correct. Awesome. I think those are some very exciting additional applications and will be cool to see how it progresses. Um, but right now I'd like to move on to actually something that you, you mentioned towards the beginning, 
But another project that your lab is working on is new drug formulations for protein therapeutics, specifically developing new excipients. Um, first, could you give an overview of you know, what excipients are and why we need new ones? Yeah, so uh, an excipient is just everything that's in your formulation that's not the active pharmaceutical ingredient. So, you know, the, the FDA regulates drugs and a drug is a, an entire formulation of stuff. Um, and so it includes an active ingredient and all of these other additives. Um, and those additives are typically things like salts or uh, buffers or, um, you know, tonicity agents, things like that, uh, and sometimes stabilizing agents. And, um, you know, the real reason why we need new ones is that many of the things on the sort of standard list of uh, what, you know, these have been historically called inactive ingredients. That's kind of a misnomer, really, because they, uh, they can be the big difference between a drug working and a drug not working. So I'd say they're doing more than just nothing. Um, the, uh, many of them are sort of grandfathered in from development of small molecule formulations, right? And it's really important to recognize that uh, in the early to mid 2000s, you know, all 10 of the top 10 drugs uh, worldwide were small molecules, right? That was sort of the, the main approach. Um, but by you know, 2014, 2015, uh, eight or so of the top 10 drugs were proteins. And there's many, many more new protein drugs uh, in development currently. Uh, and they have some really distinct formulation uh, challenges. And so in a lot of ways, formulation scientists who are just using the same old things are trying to fit, you know, a square peg in a round hole to solve some of these problems for, uh, uh, for proteins. And so I think there's a really um, important area for innovation here where uh, we need to develop new proteins that or new excipients that really uh, address the, the distinct challenges faced by proteins and other biopharmaceuticals. Awesome. And so your lab is obviously working on developing some of these new excipients, but what are you developing them for and where are you applying this technology? So one of the first uh, major areas that we worked with was insulin formulation and delivery. Um, and, you know, some of this was just uh, pragmatic in that uh, it's rather easy to get your hands on insulin. It's cheap. Um, and uh, it also has a number of major challenges that need to be overcome. It's extremely poorly stable. Uh, and in order to stabilize it, Oftentimes, the, the formulation tricks that are taken uh, to make it more stable uh, really, I, I mean, make the drug much more poor. So the main issue associated with current, even you know, what are called rapid-acting insulin drugs today is that they're simply too slow, right? You administer, and there's this big, long delay of 20 to 30 minutes before the insulin even starts acting, right? It's because of this very slow absorption uh, upon administration. Uh, in the body. And, you know, that's purely driven by the fact that insulin is poorly stable. So it's a really good target for us to try to uh, develop a, a new class of excipient with just uh, superior ability to stabilize insulin because it could both make a meaningful improvement to the efficacy of the drug uh, while also improving its uh, stability and, and uh, potentially enhance global access to these kinds of uh, critical drugs. And so this project has actually moved beyond your lab and you founded Surf Bio to advance this technology. So could you tell us a little bit more about the company and, you know, their efforts? Yeah, so we, um, you know, in our lab, we were trying to make an ultra fast acting insulin, right? And we developed this uh, really uh, you know, a, a, a new drug candidate. And we were able to demonstrate in my lab, even in, in the most translationally advanced animal model, which is a, a pig model of type one diabetes, um, that the this new drug is uh, really significantly faster than, than current fast acting insulin. Um, you know, modeling uh, studies that we were able to do based off of the pig studies showed that this new drug is four times faster, you know, potentially in, in humans than current rapid acting uh, insulin drugs. 
And so really we, we got to this point where it's kind of at the end of its useful academic lifetime because we you know, developed a good candidate, demonstrated that it worked. Uh, and really the next big step was to try to push it to the clinic. And uh, the best way to do that is uh, in a company. So, um, you know, the, the company is currently focused on uh, developing a, the non-clinical toxicology uh, data package that's needed in order to uh, file for uh, an investigational new drug um, to try to actually push it uh, towards the clinic. Cool, and it, it'll be exciting to you watch that develop and continue. Um, but what, obviously, you know, insulin was just a starting point for this technology, and there are plenty of other drugs that you use better recipients, but where where would you like to see this applied? Are there any other areas that you, you would like to explore next? Yeah, I, so one of the other big areas that we've been looking at uh, is in the formulation of uh, monoclonal uh, antibodies. antibodies. For example, so uh, a lot of antibodies um, are sufficiently unstable or, or poorly stable that they can't be concentrated to the extent that they need to be in, in order to be administered in the body in, in sort of a, you know, let's say a, a simple subcutaneous injection. So uh, a lot of antibodies are delivered via IV infusion. And so uh, this is a really good area for a stabilizing excipient because if you can improve the stability of the molecule, uh, you can enable the formulation of high concentration uh, monoclonal antibodies that could make, you know, what's what's often referred to as this IV to sub-Q switch. So you can uh, enable new sub-Q administrable formulations uh, that really simplify the administration of these drugs, um, opening access so you don't have to do this, you know, the administration's only in a clinical setting. Um, and that really opens up a lot of doors um, you know, for different kinds of, of treatments. Yes, I agree. That would be great to expand access to some of these drugs that currently you can only get in a hospital setting. Um, but moving on, uh, your research has some implications beyond the life sciences, one of which actually gained a fair amount of attention recently. <laughs> Could you tell us a little bit more about your work developing hydrogels for wildfires? Yeah, so wildfires are certainly a hot topic in uh, California, no pun intended, um, and it has been for a couple of years. And um, what's kind of interesting about this application is I get this a lot, you know, why, like wildfire, what does that have to do with, you know, drug delivery? But uh, in a lot of ways, you know, the the engineering challenges associated with you know, enabling a new, uh, a properly preventative treatment, you know, to stop wildfires from starting in the first place um, are just the same as a lot of our, our sustained delivery challenges, right? So it, it, you know, if you go back to the beginning and you think um, uh, just generally about the nature of this conversation, right? You see every year during the wildfire season, there's tons of, um, you know, media attention and uh, a common refrain is, why can't we stop these fires from starting in the first place? Right? But there's also this sort of general misconception that fires start at random, you know, anywhere in the forest. And so it's just impossible to, to stop them from starting in the first place. Um, but that's not really true. Uh, it's pretty well known that 95% or so of wildfires in the country are started by people. And so it would make sense that they start in places that people frequent. Um, we worked with folks from CAL FIRE and identified that uh, perhaps more than 80% of fires in California actually start right adjacent to roadways or uh, adjacent to utilities infrastructure or other places like this, right? So things that you could easily lump into a, you know, a high risk landscapes. Um, and so then, you know, the real question is, well, if we know where they're often starting, could we pre-treat the vegetation in those areas so that uh, even if your car does spark or, you know, somebody's car is overheating and they pull over to the side of the road, it wouldn't ignite uh, the vegetation. Um, and it, there was just a, a big technology gap, right? So for example, all of the retardants that have been used uh, traditionally, you know, the iconic 
red stuff you see drop from planes all the time, right? Um, those were designed for reactive firefighting, right? Fire starts, we load up the planes and we go out and we try to uh, lay fire lines to corral the fires and uh, to help put them out. Um, but they weren't designed for pretreatments. And so if you were to try to spray them on a, let's say a roadside segment that is known to be the source of a lot of ignitions year after year, um, a heavy dew or a light rain would be enough to simply wash it away, even if those don't necessarily uh, end the fire season. And so the only way to make it possible to be, to, you know, retreat these areas many times throughout the year, and that's just simply not feasible. Uh, both in terms of, um, you know, person hours and cost. Um, but really, that's just a delivery challenge, right? It goes back to the same old adage. If the active ingredient isn't where it needs to be when it needs to be there, it doesn't work. So uh, we tried to, or what we were able to do is leverage some of our hydrogel technology to encapsulate uh, the same fire retardants that are used in, uh, you know, the red stuff dropped from planes. So because uh, there's a really long history of safety and efficacy of these retardants, uh, and really just tried to improve targeting onto the vegetation, so more of what you spray actually sticks, uh, and to improve the retention, so that you could treat once, you know, early in the season in June or something like that, um, and provide season-long protection uh, against ignition. So, um, you know, it would only be when we would have a major rain event, you know, two or three inches of rain or something like that, that the materials would just simply wash off and then uh, biodegrade in the soil. So it, it really does come back to this, you know, just control delivery challenge. And uh, we had the right technology in hand and the right expertise to address that challenge. Awesome. So this is a very cool product and one that is desperately needed in California. But for you, it's not just a one-off thing. You believe that there's a lot of potential life science technologies that could be applied more broadly. Could you talk a little bit more about this? Yeah, so I, I firmly believe that innovation happens at interfaces between adjacent fields, right? So for so long, fields have been fairly siloed, um, right? And people develop uh, expertise and uh, just worldviews and ways of thinking about problems or protein problems uh creatively developing new solutions to their problems that uh you know if you were to take it across an interface to somewhere else you could really uh generate you know important new advancements so um, i think it's it's just important to recognize that um there's a, a great opportunity for expertise technologies just ways of thinking about things uh to spill over and in, into adjacent uh, fields and, and really create new solutions to uh, important, often longstanding problems. I completely agree. And I think we are we're coming up at the end of our time, but before we go, I wanted to ask you a few closing questions. First off, where can people learn more about your work? Yeah, so I, the best place to learn about our work is on our lab website. Um, it's www.supramolecularbiomaterials.com. Uh, uh, again, that's a bit of a mouthful. So um, certainly you can access it via the, the Stanford Material Science and Engineering uh, website. Um, we also have a Twitter account where we uh, showcase a lot of the our recent research efforts. Awesome. And before we go, do you have any shameless plugs or last closing thoughts? Yeah, so I, uh, you know, the big ones are uh, Surf Bio is having a, a fundraising round uh, this fall, really to fund uh, all of the non-clinical talks work and, and push through a, a, our initial uh, phase one clinical trial efforts. Um, and our wildfire prevention product is uh, commercially available now through um, a company called Perimeter Solutions, the same one that produces the red stuff. Uh, and the product is called FOSCheck Fortify. So. Awesome. Well, it will be exciting to watch both of those uh, products and companies grow. But Eric, thank you so much for an absolutely incredible episode. Uh, this was a lot of fun and we're really grateful for your time. Yeah, thank you again for having me. It was a pleasure.